So hello everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be speaking here today. And I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. And uh, today I would like to tell us about our results on constraints on thermodynamic state transitions in the Markovian regime. And um, this work was done in collaboration with Matteo Lostalio, currently at QTEC in Delft. And the outline of my talk is as follows. Uh, I will first give you a few words of motivation and then formally state the problem that we are interested in. Uh, I will not bore you too much with any technical details because 15 minutes is a little bit too short for that, but I will still introduce or uh, describe our main technical tool that we introduced to attack the problem. And then I will, uh, I will get to presenting our results and explaining how they can be applied to study some interesting thermodynamic problems and in particular to assess the, the role of memory um, effects in um, optimal thermodynamic protocols like cooling or work extraction. And at the end, I will I give a few avenues for future research. Okay, so let me start by asking you, what can we say about the dynamics of a given system without solving the equations of motion, actually? So um, in other words, are, are, are there some fundamental constraints uh, that are quite model independent that allow us to say that some things can and some things cannot happen. Well, in, for closed systems, we have conservation laws, for example. So if, if you consider as an example, uh, a classical harmonic oscillator in one dimension, and you tell me it's momentum and position, uh, you don't need to solve the equations of motion actually to, to know that at any given time in the future, uh, its position in phase space will be restricted to this ellipsis that corresponds to the, to the um, fixed energy. For open systems, obviously, the uh, situation is much more complicated, but we can still say some non-trivial things. Uh, the standard example here is uh, that of a uh, gas of particles that start in some uh, corner of a box and then expand to occupy the full volume of the box with the opposite process, the reverse process, and never actually happening. So one of the um, main aims of the resource theoretic approach to, to quantum thermodynamics is to try say something non-trivial, what can happen, what can't happen, using minimal assumptions of the quantum theory, what, can, what cannot happen for open systems that interact with thermal buffs. Okay, let me be a little bit more specific here. Uh, so what we consider is a quantum system, a finite dimensional quantum system, initially at the state rho zero, and this at time, yeah, time zero, um, interacting with uh, arbitrary thermal Heat buffs. When I say arbitrary thermal heat buffs, I mean systems described by arbitrary Hamiltonians, but still prepared in a thermal Gibbs state. And I want to ask, what can, what can the state of the system be at some later time t f? Where, where can it evolve to? Are there some constraints? And this, this question was originally asked by Michal Hordecki and Jonathan Oppenheim in, uh, in, this, in 2013. And they considered uh, those interactions between system and, and, and the buffs to be given by arbitrary energy conserving unitaries. Um, let me note two things here then. First, when you uh, allow for arbitrary unitaries to, to happen, uh, the system can get arbitrarily correlated with, with the buffs, and then those correlations can later affect the, the, the dynamics of the system, so we, have a, a strong, we can have strong non-Markovian effects. And second of all, from the perspective of a control theory, actually, if you, if you want to understand this, it would require you to have the control over all degrees of freedom of, of thermal, buff, thermal buffs. So what we wanted to do is um, just maybe not simplify, but like to take a little bit more realistic buffs and ask, okay, so maybe just let me say that when they consider this, they, they, they got to this concept of thermal operations. So any kind of transformation that can happen like this, uh, they called it a thermal operation. And we wanted to, to do a kind of a, a more realistic or physically justified model with, with infinite buffs where the evolution of the system and a buff is actually Markovian. So the, anything that goes to the buff decays very quickly or the correlations. And our idea was to try to understand what's going to happen if we replace those arbitrary energy conserving unitaries with uh, Markovian energy conserving interactions. So to be a little... Um, more specific, even more, let me say that well, how we approach this. So we start with a general uh, open quantum system dynamics that is um, Markovian. So we have this master equation with the 
uh, with the Hamil unitary part described by Hamiltonian, and then the dissipative part described with Mladian with arbitrary time dependent jump rates there. And, um, and then we also add two more assumptions. First, I mean, for a Markovian thermal process, because we want to have a Markovian version of the thermal operation. So we call it a Markovian thermal process. And we add two um, assumptions. First, that this Lindadian has to lead in a long time limit to thermalize the state. So the thermal state should be stationary. And second of all, it should be covariant, the Lindadian, which basically encodes um, total energy conservation at each infinitesimal moment in time. And let me just note that the microscopic derivations of, of master equations and evolutions usually do satisfy those two, uh, those two constraints. Okay, so what is a Markovian thermal process? Well, Markovian thermal process is, is any quantum channel that arises from integrating this equation. I mean, you can choose whatever parameters you want there, those, those rates and so on, um, as long as it satisfies those two properties. And then our main question is, what can be, so we don't look at general states, but we just look at um, occupations in the energy eigenbasis. So what can be, if you give me a system initially with some distribution over the energies, what can this distribution be at some later time? Are there some constraints on that? We would like to find, like, I mean, optimally you would like for a given P0, we would like to find the whole set of final distributions that can be achieved by Markovian thermal processes. Okay. Um, so the main technical tool that we use is continuous thermal majorization that we work. So what's the continuous thermal majorization? It's a relation between two probability vectors uh, that holds if and only if you can find a continuous path connecting those two probability uh, distributions such that every preceding distribution on this path uh, thermal majorizes every following one. Uh, so it's a generalization of a concept of thermal majorization, and for those of you who don't know what thermal majorization is, it's also a generalization of a concept of majorization that you probably know. So major, while majorization tells us um, this, this divides the states with, from the one from the farthest from the uniform state to the one closest to the uniform state, uh, thermal majorization is basically the ordering of probability vectors that goes from the farthest from the Gibbs state or the thermal Gibbs state to the to the closest to the Gibbs state. Um, and why is it important for us? Well, in, we proved that in our case, in this problem that I described, this Markovian thermal process, is this, this particular ordering fully describes our problem. That is, there exists a Lindbladian that would generate this transition from the initial P0 population of energy eigenstates states to the final PTF, if and only if uh, this uh, relation, a uh, continuous thermal majorization between them holds. Hey, but we are not happy with that yet because that's uh, actually a pretty hard um, condition to verify, right? I mean, you would have to go to the space of all possible paths connecting and try to understand whether whether there is a path such that you can have this thermal majorization, like infinitely many conditions to check. And well, but it's a nice starting point, and um, we can maybe first rewrite this. Um, we can maybe first rewrite this in a little bit more familiar form which is, uh, it resembles a little bit um, entropy production relations. So we say that a dynamic, dynamical evolution of populations can happen, uh, it can be generated by Markovian thermal processes, even only if all those entropy-like quantities increase um, in time. The, the difference is it's not only that, you know, it's, it's, it's the important thing is that on the if and only if, right? So it's not that those things increase because you can always write some monotones that increase during the evolution. But the point is that if they all um, increase, then you are definitely sure that there exists a Lindbladian that, that um, generates a, a given evolution, a transition. Okay, so that, but that's still very hard to verify. So what we did next was um, we had this, well, it can be considered a technical tool, but we actually showed that, um, that, uh, one, that there exists a Markovian thermal process between the two distributions, if and only if you can find a sequence of elementary thermalizations that map one to the other. And what are elementary thermalizations? Well, those are just stock because on, on distributions we have stochastic matrices acting on them, and those elementary thermalizations are very simple stochastic matrices. Namely, they act non-trivially only on two levels, two energy levels of a system. And on all the rest, I would say they act, act trivially on all but two, and on those two, they just thermalize them, bring them closer to the, to the Gibbs state. So basically, um, we have to look for those sequences, you could think. 
And then maybe the other comment, so this is a technical tool that I'm going to use in a second, but uh, you can also think from the perspective of control theory that that's an interesting result, simply because, you know, there is a big space of invadience. You could, it's a, a really uh, complicated stuff, but then if you, if you are just focused on state transitions, you can achieve every state transitions just by doing, like coupling two levels at a time and thermalizing them. And every possible state transition will be achieved like that, can be achieved like that. So you don't need to go to very complicated invariants and so on. Okay, so let's go further. So our main result then is this algorithmic verification of, um, of this condition where the MTP means there is exist a Markovian thermal process. Sorry, I didn't say this. So um, there exists a Markovian thermal process going from P0 to PDF. We don't need to, to solve those continuous number of infinitely continuous number of conditions. We actually find a finite set of conditions that needs to be verified. And moreover, whenever the, this, uh, these conditions are satisfied, we can give you the Lindladian that realizes this transition. Um, and a slight modification of this, uh, of this uh, algorithm actually gives you a full set of states that can be achieved from P0 by Markovian ther thermal processes. So we say algorithmic verification, actually you can write them down, the con the, 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 all the um, conditions, but there's just a lot of them. So you actually, for any, um, they, grow, um, they grow very fast in D. It's finite, so you can check it on the computer. For small dimensions, you can even check in the paper, but if you're interested, you can go and the, the algorithm is freely available. The mathematical implementation of, of it is freely available there. Uh, for those of you interested, uh, okay, maybe just a few words how this works. So I just said that there is a Markovian thermal process mapping those two things, if and only if there is a, a sequence of uh, elementary thermal operations, elementary thermalizations. And uh, actually, if you think a little harder, you can show that out, out of those elementary thermalizations, you don't need to consider all of them. You can only consider extremal sequences. And then enumerating those extremal sequences and checking for them allows you to, to verify this uh, existence of MTP between uh, two given distributions. Okay, so what, uh, what can we use those results for? I mean, why, why, would, why do we care? Well, uh, from this paper all by Oppenheim and Hordetsky, we had those uh, ultimate restrictions on, on some thermodynamic protocols. I mean, you know, if you could control perfectly the buff and do everything with it, there are still some restrictions on, let's say, how much work you can extract from a given non-equilibrium system. And here now we have a similar thing, but now we don't assume all this control over the buff. We just assume very simple uh, um, Markovian dynamics. And we can compare now the two results and see what, and the, all the benefit that will come will come from the fact that there are non-Markovian effects in the other one, right? I mean, um, so okay, let me just try the first, uh, the first application. There's a very simple thing. You have an out of equilibrium system. You have some battery, uh, which is your ancillary system in some ground state. And what you want to do is you want to perform some, you want to couple them together to a, to a thermal bath. And then your goal is to charge the battery as much as possible. So move it to the excited state. Uh, of as large energy as possible. So this can be modeled in this, in this situation by saying that, well, your system is described by some um, energy distributions, your initial battery is in the ground state, and you want to go to the excited state. I just put epsilon because usually in single shot considerations like this, there is also a small failure probability that you're gonna, that the protocol will not work, so you'll not extract the work. And you can compare this versus whatever can be done with thermal processes or thermal operations. And we did this simple, uh, some simple uh, simulations here. So now we can compare how much this on the x-axis we have the amount of work we can get. On the y-axis you have the uh, the um, the error. Obviously there is a trade-off. The more work you want to extract from a given system, um, the bigger the failure probability is going to be. But you see a very big separation between thermal processes and Markovian thermal processes. So. Let me just stress and emphasize, it's not that there is some Markovian operation that we found and we say, oh, this Markovian is worse than some uh, thermal uh, operation. It's optimized over all possible thermal processes and optimized over all possible Markovian thermal, thermal processes. So we see there is a big gap in performance and this all comes from, uh, from the non-Markovian effects or from, from, from the memory. Another application, well, okay, we just uh, try to um, just some funny uh, example of algorithmic heat buff cooling. So this is uh, a modification of it. So you start with a system. Uh, this is, is going to be a four-level system in a second uh, that is in thermal equilibrium with the buff. And the way you want to cool it is you first going to perform some unitary that's going to invert the populations. And then you want to 
um, couple it to the bath and try to increase the, the ground state occupation as much as possible. Again, we can, you can do this with, uh, with, um, with uh, thermal processes and Markovian thermal processes. And we can, on the X axis, we have different uh, temperatures of the bath. On the Y axis, we see how much the ground state occupation can increase in one round of such a, a heat bath algorithmic cooling protocol. Again, we see that there is a, a big improvement when you use thermal processes as compared to Markovian thermal processes. And again, that's uh, optimized over all, possi all, all possible Markovian thermal processes and all possible thermal operations. Yes, on the y-axis, there, the, there is the increase in the ground state population. You want to increase, well, you could, because those are, those, those you, you could do the temperature, right? But for four level system, you, well, it's not all states are thermal states, right? So if you just want to increase, improve the, like if you do it many, many times, you're gonna go very close to one, so to the ground state of, of you know, zero temperature. So yeah, ground state of zero temperature, or deep state of zero temperature. Okay, and, um, and well, maybe a final application that is uh, an interesting one. So, so far I was just telling you what's Markovian and what's non-Markovian. So you can see how effect, memory effects can, uh, improve stuff, uh, performance of protocols. But then maybe we can also try to understand how introducing a little bit of memory, not all memory, but a little bit of memory, like step by step, more and more memory, we can get closer to, to the, um, like quantify the improvements coming from finite amounts of memory that we add. And this can be done, for example, by Considering those catalytic transformations, so catalytic transformations are such that you, you have some ancillary system that starts in the same state as it ends up. So it can change in the meanwhile, but uh, at the beginning and the end, it's uncorrelated and it's, it's in the same state as the, yeah, it doesn't change. So if you bring such a state, uh, yeah, um, such a catalytic state, even if it's thermal, uh, you kind of enlarge the size of your system and this catalyst can act in the meanwhile as a memory. So what you're gonna have here is um, okay. So again, some cooling. So on the on the y, x axis here, you're gonna have the the bath temperature or the inverse temperature of the bath. Here you're gonna have how much you can cool your system. Like I think the system starts twice hotter than the the bath initially, and you try to cool it down. So with Markovian stuff, which is this blue line here, well, if this Markovian is two-level system. It started colder, sorry, hotter, and you want to cool it. You're gonna end up only at the level of of the temperature of the bath. You can't go further. There was no memory. You couldn't. You basically, thermalizes, thermalizes. It reaches the bath's temperature, and then it's end. However, if you allow to have this catalyst, even if it's a single qubit catalyst, what's gonna happen is you can actually go to the to the it's this dashed line. You can go all the way to the bath's temperature, but then you also can go a little bit further. And this is for free, right? I mean, it's for free in the sense that you don't put any thermodynamic resource because you, this catalyst is given back to you, but you use it in the meanwhile as a memory. And then you can do two, so yeah, this is 2D catalyst, and then you could do 3D, 4D. I mean, well, the simulations, well, uh, I couldn't finish them <laughs> before coming here, but you can expect that when you get bigger and bigger, I'm almost finished. When you get bigger and bigger catalyst, this line is basically going to the red line, which is the line that you have for thermal processes with that have arbitrary amounts of memory. Okay, um, so very fast. Well, let's see um, for the outlook. Uh, so first of all, we'd like to apply this. So those were three, some, three quick examples for some small systems. Um, those were the first thing that came to our mind, but we would like to actually use this formalism to, to study some non-Markovian boost to relevant thermodynamic processes. And actually, there's already a, um, a paper on archive from Susanna Skvelga's group from Ulm. Where they, where they use our formalism to study the non-Markovianity boost to the efficiency of non-biomolecular switches. Then um, we also would like to understand the asymptotic behavior of, of this continuous thermomodulization. So in the standard framework, this uh, asymptotic framework allowed us to, for example, recover, in, in, when you look in the thermal operations framework, allowed people to recover things like in the asymptotic limit. So when you have many, many particles, it's only the free energy that matters and you have some reversibility stuff going on and we don't really know what's going to happen here when we have this uh, lack of memory. So that would be interesting. Obviously the standard thing, it would be nice to extend this formalism to not only look at the distributions over the energies, but actually to understand general states raw to sigma, like raw zero to raw at T with coherence in the energy eigen basis. And finally, this may be um, boring stuff, but actually I think it's very important uh, because we are not computer scientists and our algorithmic verification procedure is pretty, pretty slow. And we are pretty sure that we can improve it. And this would be interesting for uh, applications because you could 
study larger systems then. And uh, more soon on archive, this is the reference that is still not there, but hopefully by the end of the month, it's gonna be there. And thanks for your attention. Uh, hi, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I have a question about uh, the coherences. Do you have any intuition why this uh, assumption of Markovianity would help us to maybe derive some strict bounds on the evolution of coherences, on the transition of coherences? If you, why it can it be helpful? Well, I don't know if it's going to be helpful. I just say that it would be nice to have it, but it could be helpful because sometimes when you put more restrictions, you actually end up like, for example, um, most probably here, you're gonna have just dephasings, right? I mean, in, in with thermal operations, you could move coherences, you could store them. Here, most probably the, the only evolutions that could happen would be some kind of generalized dephasings because of, uh, because of the lack of memory. So this could possibly um, be easier, but I'm not sure if it's gonna be easier. I just would like to solve it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, question, yes. Because you said it's a moment that you can get something for free, Yes. On the other Here. Mm -hmm. I, I think you start with the formalism when you have time dependence in this dumping coefficients. Yeah? Yes, this that's true. And usually time dependence, especially in dumping coefficients, means that you have to change Hamiltonians, and this is always related to work. Yes, uh, well, that's true that the, those time dependent uh, jump rates are there, but actually, uh, what you can show is that. The only real, so this proof that shows that you only need uh, those elementary thermalizations means that whatever you can do with this time changing there it can be it can be just done by bringing to different buffs. It's like, you know, um, they don't have to be, it's, you, you introduce slowly to the buff, very slowly, you interact with one buff, then you introduce to another one, to another one, but yes, you're right, maybe there is some, yes, that's true. Yes, yeah, well, no, I, I don't claim that there are any miracles, no, definitely. Okay. 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 Thank you very much.